no good advice? You've been ignoring good advice your whole life. Welcome to Shitty Life Advice. I didn't see ya. My name's Sam Lamont. Welcome to Shitty Life Advice, Episode 8 on Attachment Theory. Now, I have brought several experts to help you better understand attachment style theory and its implications for you. I want you to remember that this is a theory, kind of like gravity. And it's brought to you probably by the same people who buried the dinosaur bones. But anyway, attachment style theory is pretty simple. The basic premise is that how your parents met or didn't meet your needs as a child impacts the way you will relate to others as an adult. Now this theory originates in the middle of the 20th century where all great ideas originate from like Agent Orange and leaded gas, and CFCs and DDT pesticides. So you know it's good. Attachment style theory has four basic categories of what kind of person you are deep down in your core, in your heart and soul. You are either a secure attachment person. Trust me, you're not a secure attachment person. If you were, you wouldn't be watching a show like this, but we'll get around to that. You're anxious or you're avoidant or you're disorganized. Now, disorganized is kind of the lowest of the low. So we're going to not mention them because they should probably be exiled from society. And basically it's just the secure and the, the three rejects. My experts might try to convince you at some point that paying attention to the way your needs were or were not meant as a child and understanding the way you attach to others could be useful to you. But in summary, I'd like to prep you with this vital piece of information before we begin the show. You want to at least pretend to be a secure attachment style. Take the tests over and over until you get that secure attachment style verdict, screenshot it, and for the rest of your days, whenever you have any relationship problems, just send him that screenshot. Just say, it ain't me, buddy. You're the fucked up one. Life is really about pretending to be okay, even if you're not okay. And so with that, I'd like to ground you for this episode of Shitty Life Advice. Well, hello, hello everybody. <laughs> Uh, welcome to our eighth episode of Shitty Life Advice. We're, we're still in the previews, we're calling this. Uh, figuring out all the details, getting a little bit better each week. And um, when the glasses go on, you get shitty life advice. So I know I pretty much covered it all there, but is there anything you want to say before we get going about what attachment style is and why it's important? Yes, lots. Um, so your attachment style starts getting formed actually in the womb. Um, and by the time you're three, it's about 75% set up. That's your default primary attachment style. So is that how much Beethoven your mother plays for you? <laughs> part of it, yeah. But also part of it is how stressed she is when she's pregnant with you, believe it or not. Okay. So, um, but, and, uh, your primary you attachment style, uh, well, the jury's out. My mom was a single mom. She was super stressed. Am I fucked? <laughs> no. I don't believe you. Okay, you, keep you're, going. Okay, but here's the thing. You're set up to be potentially fucked, but you're not irreparably fucked. I don't believe you. All right, keep going. Okay. So, <laughs> um, you can change your attachment style because the more we learn about the brain, the more we learn that these default settings, even though they're set up really young, are malleable basically forever. So all of our adult relationships continue to shape our attachment style. Um, if you're going to reduce yourself to a singular attachment style and be done with it, that's not a helpful way to look at it. If you can understand the spectrum of attachment styles and the way that you attach to different kinds of people in your life, so you might have a different attachment style with coworkers or friends and family members than you might with romantic relationships, you can understand uh, yourself and your relationships better. So it's an important data piece that you should continue to think about and interrogate um, throughout your adulthood. Ben? Um, well, I find that there's a drive towards community and attachment even when people are avoidant. Uh, maybe like you, Sam, who push people away. Um, <coughs> wow, you with, think with, I'm an avoidant? I with do with not. the with the glasses on, with uh, the glasses wait, on. Wait, hold on, glasses are coming on. That's interesting. Keep going, keep going. No, I with <laughs> I'm referring to your to your 
My persona. Your persona. Yeah. Mm. So uh, a lot of times it it can get pretty messy because you can have two wildly avoid. One's avoidant, one's Mm. aggressive, one's this, one's that. And everyone is trying to attach two people, even if they swear they don't want to, or even if um, they're super mentally ill. And so you get a lot of, I think a lot of the problems in the world (laughs) actually come from people trying to connect because there's an inner drive to connect. Can I actually add something to that? Please. I think we think of connection as this like extra thing. Like we food shelter water is first and connection comes later. Great. Mm -hmm. If you have it fine, if you don't, but Mm -hmm. the way that attachment forms, the reason it forms when you're between zero and three is because we need to connect to get food, shelter and water. Yes. So it is arguably more foundational than those things. Yeah. One of the things that came up while I was prepping for the show, glasses Mm -hmm. are off, glasses are off, (laughs) is um, that part of why attachment is so important to us is because we have to pass the the brain through the birth canal. Mm -hmm. And so because we have to do that, we are super vulnerable for a long time, right? right? We were not able to run away from predators. Mm -hmm. And so because the trade-off of getting the big brain has meant that we just have to exponentially be way more social of creatures. Right. Mm -hmm. Because we're pathetic and weak little children. <laughs> and brilliant with huge brains. And brilliant. A- another um, thing to look at is like if you take somebody with us, if you say have someone from Saudi Arabia and somebody from uh, uh, great uh, the UK having conversation, the guy from the Saudi Arabia will back up, back the person from Great Britain up against a wall because their personal space is different. You know what I'm saying? So they're in, in that part of the world, you want to be close enough to someone to smell them if you're speaking to them. And so you get this dynamic with people in general where there's a lot of chaos because everybody's expectations about what closeness is, is different. Mm. So there's like a cultural overlay, a uh, cultural overlay and an individual overlay. So mm. the cultural overlay, the cultural example is just, is just an easy way to, 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 to visualize what happens with people all the time, everywhere, every day mm. in the grocery store, wherever that everybody has different expectations about what it means to be close. Mm. I like you right where you are, Ben. <laughs> so you six think feet away. he's just, dis- organized no i said avoid avoid, avoidant avoidant with the glasses on well because the thing is is that he's he's he uses his his terrible uh glasses and um his 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 prickly persona to to to, i don't know what's happening here to to defend just ignore me vulnerability no this is more interesting than what i was saying (laughs) i want to just keep going i want to say while we're while we're at this that um what's happening you we talk very (laughs) frequently as if you can reduce yourself to your attachment style so we will say i actually just did it when i said his he is you think he is right and that's a failure of language we need to understand you look like a duck and i can't look at you (laughs) 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 we need to understand that our attachment style is kind of like clothing style in a way and i don't say that to minimize it but Mm -hmm. that you might have different kind of epics in your life where you dress and your style is completely different Mm -hmm. and the same is true with relationships and Mm -hmm. so to reduce ourselves to i can see him everywhere i look (laughs) (laughs) to reduce ourselves as if we are a singular attachment style is to get the science so deeply wrong and we need to stop Ben let it slip last week that he hates the color yellow. <laughs> so, oh, that's happening. Yes. Oh, I wore a yellow shirt. Too. I have brought this just to help bring out the best <laughs> performance. Well, life. Sam gave me a stern talking to by not being so negative, <clears throat> so I'm going to refrain from <laughs> criticizing his uh, color choices. Yeah. Do you know the uh, wrestling terms? No. I'm the heel. You're the baby faces. Okay. Means you're the heroes. Okay. You're the good ones. I like it. Okay. Anyway. Before we, we have a lot to cover yep. this, in this short time that we have together. And before we do, I would like to ground everybody and just get everybody ready for the kind of mature and adult conversations that we hope to have on this program. So without further ado, here is my grounding exercise. All right. Uh, meditation music starting in three, two, one. I want you... To breathe. Breathing was the first thing you ever did on this planet, in this you human life, breathing? and you're still not My very good little. at it. <laughs> Baby Chihuahua Terrier can breathe better than you. John Bowlby. <laughs> and for this exercise, for attachment theory, we're going to go way, way back. Avoid it. We're going to go back to you. Avoid things. <laughs> and I want you... To think about Google Gaga, what Google kind of Chacha. parents your parents were to you. Or if you were abandoned, 
What did you do to deserve that? Cuckoo gaga, cuckoo cha cha. <laughs> Why were you such a bad kid? Look at that little child version of you. Cuckoo gaga, cuckoo cha cha. <laughs> Think of your mommy not loving no you enough. No amount of love will fix your attachment issues. <laughs> will you anxiety? Will you accept responsibility? Mary Ainsworth. <laughs> Will you understand that Birdman Lorenz? Not everyone ha, has misbehaved ha, ha. as you. <laughs> I want you to think about. Oh, and I want you to connect. What you could have done differently. I want you to listen, like, <gasps> to that little voice inside you. How you were clearly broken. That from voice the you've been ignoring. That one that tells you all yes, the and things I want you, to you know deep down. Imagine. Are true. What it would Mogazar feel like is, is that voice's name. <laughs> to have been loved. And you know what it's saying. To have had your needs and emotional saying, safety needs met. I am Mogazar. What does that feel like in your body? I'm the thought that keeps you up at night. What does being a safe little loved child feel like? I'm that thing you do today. <laughs> that all could have been yours if you behaved better. But you didn't. Bulby. <laughs> and I want you uh, to uh, think about uh, the first thing that really hurt you. Birdman Lorenz. <laughs> Look at that thing. You're like a little What was it? Goose geese thing. <laughs> was it I'll getting shut down? down any fucking cardboard box it stifled? That you didn't print as your parent. Was it being ignored or abandoned? Go back to that pain moment. Connect with that impulse. Look at it. Pick your face. <laughs> Look at it with the eyes of an adult. To think about that thing you didn't do today. And won't that's do today. why you can't have nice things. What is the first thing you hated about That's yourself? the moment. <laughs> that's the moment your life was doomed. Goo goo, ka -choo. That first pain, that was it. Yes. It's all the problems of another time. There's nothing you can do about it now. You're never going to be loved. All you can do is eat more Cheetos and maybe like continue to behave badly. Anxious. <laughs> I want you to take a moment to acknowledge your own. All the times you were made a legitimate victim. Disorganized. <laughs> Most of these probably happened many, many years ago. Even decades. If you were secure, you'd be married. Now we are going to gently <laughs> and easily bring you back. Your to consciousness to teach you about attachment theory. Petroleum-based solutions. And count down <laughs> from ten. Three, nine, <laughs> fourteen, eleven, four, two, it's too late. One, seven, seventy-seven. You are that bad. Bingo person. bongo. Your desire to eat uh, cheese and what's your at infinity you? Google. Your desire to eat cheese at eleven, fourteen, hey, seven, seven. CFCs, diesel gasoline, uh, five. Mm. Horrendous bodily dysmorphia. You All the stuff you're not traffic going to do today. Sees you. Your only hope is to find a secure person and attach yourself to them. Four. That person who doesn't love you back. It's too late Two. for you. You are that bad That of a thing person. wrong with your eyelids. <laughs> what your parents thought One. about you is correct. Wow. Okay. There we go. In in in. Can you press M, uh, Reese? Thank you. In brain scan studies, sometimes they need to give like a stimulus to create a certain brain response so that they can look at it in the machine, and I think they could use that to bring on panic attacks. <laughs> yeah, I told Reese to go real weird weird with it today, and he brought it. I was crying this morning though. I was. Why? I watched it for the first time. I, oh, laughing. I, yeah. Yeah. No. I'm, I was I'm, crying. Yeah. You know, if there's one thing that will come out of this, you will always remember John Bowlby. Yeah, forever. And maybe and Mary Ainsworth. Maybe, yeah, should have hit that. Okay, so should we talk about the origins of attachment style? Sure. 
Okay. You want to go? You want to go? I'll go. Okay. I love it. Basically, John Bowlby, um, who was apparently a science man, um, (laughs) got the, he got sick. He was like a, um, angry with the system. And he's like, ah, therapy is so dumb that we talk to adults when they're already fucked up. We should study kids like the goose guy, Mr. Lorenz. Lorenz was a guy who showed that geese or graylings will imprint on any creature that they first make contact with. Mm -hmm. And like, so Lorenz was a group of geese's parent and also a cardboard box with a string attached to it was a group of geese's parent. And so Bowlby using his wife who who did all the research. He basically had the idea and she did all the work. I imagine them like at the dinner table and he's like, what if we did this? And she's like, okay. Yeah. Sounds like he also recreated my parents. Yeah, so <laughs> Olby gets his wife, and his wife gets her PhD students to do mm-hmm. all the research, and they come up with what we are still calling today attachment theory. Mm-hmm. And the way they looked at that was they wanted to see how kids were attaching to their primary caregivers. And so they would have the kid come in, the parent would leave them and then come back. And they were looking at patterns in what the kid would do when the parent left and came back. And a secure attached child would feel a little bit of emotion when the parent left them and then calm down, kind of attached to another caregiver in the room. And then when they, when the, when the parent came back, they would be excited. The anxious attached kid would be inconsolable and couldn't attach to a new person until they were, you know, given the idea that the parent was going to come back. The avoidant child didn't attach to anybody kind of disconnected and didn't attach to another caregiver. And the disorganized child behaved in a way that was disorganized, cried when the parent left or didn't cry and then cried when they came back. And so that formed the theory, and we should underscore that it's a theory, that there are four primary ways to attach to a primary caregiver. Is this like um, backed up with like research and stuff? Is like, is there, have they done like mm-hmm. studies and stuff that, that really does fall into those categories? Yeah, so I can't remember the year. That was the 70s, early 70s, I think. When it first came out? Yeah. And I then think it was... I think it was in like the 50s. He, oh, really? Well, he, he went to school and Bowlby went to school in the 30s. Oh, okay. So. I know they've repeated uh, the study. So that so it's still a prevailing theory, but it's still a theoretical structure. We don't have any sort of like, you know, just like in any theory. There's not like, we could come up with another theory that could disrupt it. Okay. And so what we know is that disorganized, which basically means that your parents like couldn't stably feed you. Right, that's like or the, give you care. That's so like it's, the lowest of the low. Or or give you care. So they they were confusing to you, and also it can be there's often trauma looped in here. So it could be that your parents fed you and they gave you, you know, food, water, shelter, but were profoundly confusing on an emotional level, and so you received love in a way that was really inconsistent, and that inconsistency is profoundly confusing to the stress response system. What I got from doing some of the research mm-hmm. was that. Um, Anxious people are the hardest to break up with (laughs) or the most fun, you know, if you're a really sick puppy. If you want chaos. If you want chaos, Mm, they will lose their fucking mind Mm -hmm. if you try to break up with them. So that's who that was in your life. Mm -hmm. Everybody has one, I'm sure. Um, And disorganized were the hardest patients, Mm -hmm. right? So practitioners talking amongst themselves, they're saying, you know, I got to clear some extra room when I get a somebody who falls in the category of disorganized. So Mm -hmm. that's how I came to the conclusion that they are the worst. Mm -hmm. And um, for the advice, the first advice for almost all of the three damaged categories, broken and damaged categories, (laughs) was to be in relationship with a secure person. Yes, because they're like the fucking they're like type O blood. It's like <laughs> do you have a problem? Find a boyfriend who has it together. Because like, make that poor man suffer. Take away his ability to have a happy no, and no, no, safe no, 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 life no, no, no. with another secure person so how and does, doom them. How does borderline personality disorder differ from somebody who's disorganized? Because it sounds like we're describing the same thing to me. I don't know what the research is that blends the two. I'd like to keep them separate because not everyone who's disorganized, attached, ends up having borderline personality disorder. One of the reasons is that you're not necessarily attached in all, like if you think of your life as quadrant, you have romantic relationship, family relationship, acquaintances, coworkers, and friends, Mm -hmm. you might only be disorganized in one of those areas. Okay. And so a a personality disorder, as you know, kind of 
takes itself out across all so of somebody with borderline will come across as those things but someone with those things will not necessarily be borderline there, yeah there might be some overlap but i don't want to fuse the two that's too reductive Anyway, this would not be shitty life advice if we were not giving back to other humans and helping people. And so um, I would like to point out about attachment styles, we have a very funny dynamic here in this studio right now, which is the entire crew is married or engaged and the, and the entire cast is single. Womp. <laughs> yeah, so maybe we have the cameras pointed in the uh, Should we turn them around wrong here? direction today. But anyway... We also have a hero who it sounds like is married, uh, named Wayne. Wayne. Oh, you have to do that one more time. Hi, yes, I am married. Uh, how long have you been wa- married, Wayne? 18 years. Uh, blink twice if you're safe. <laughs> that was only one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, do so. without what you will. Okay. And do you know what attachment style you are, Wayne? Oh, I am anxious, preoccupied. Cool. And on a weekly basis, how much of a problem are you for the the people in your (laughs) life? Um, I'm not anxious, preoccupied in my marriage, weirdly enough. Oh. So with friends? So um, just with other relationships in my life, I guess. Uh, But it wasn't with my wife. What are you with your wife? Secure. (laughs) Nice. I see what you're doing there. Yeah. <laughs> I am the same. No, I'm not, no, not making it up. I don't know why that is. <laughs> okay. And um, what attachment style is your dog? <laughs> <laughs> Anxious. Uh, what's your dog's name? Sadie. Sadie. Oh, Aww. man. That's my I, sister's dog's name. I had a What Sadie. kind of dog is it? Looks like a golden. Oh, she's growling. Uh, oh, she's no. a golden retriever. You should go get her. Oh. She's right there. She is? Yeah, yeah. She's, you can see like can you her. See her? Oh, she's, just oh, the, she's right there. Yeah, she's the same color as the floor. Hi, Sadie. Hi, Sadie. <laughs> yeah, she is. She just blends right in. She doesn't know what's going on. And Wayne, I understand that you're a deeply troubled individual who needs our help desperately. Uh, what What are you working on today? <laughs> I, I don't know what she told you, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> MC told um, us I everything. I am just working on <laughs> art on my iPad. You're working on art on the iPad? Uh, yeah, just just doing some uh, uh, sketching. I'm creating some characters. Uh, maybe I'll turn them into a comic at some point or something. Wayne is an amazing artist. And just doodling around. Oh, cool. Do people, is this for fun or for work? <sighs> Both. <Sorry. laughs> yeah, it's for, um, uh, I'm, I'm an art director for magazines in my professional life and uh, art for fun in my private life i usually uh use my art to uh i the only the only way i've used my art for for, uh, money in the past is just to raise money for like um different interests like uh during uh covid i helped raise money for some uh, wildlife rehabilitation places for selling by selling my portraits and stuff so that's what i've done with my art in the past wow nice do you think that gets you a better seat in heaven i (laughs) know It or doesn't. Does it make people feel better about about being your friend? Yeah. Yeah, it does. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I helped raise some money for foster kids lately, and I feel great. And if you don't like me, that clearly means that you're just a bad person, because I'm a great person. <laughs> I never thought about that connection. That's uh, so what, what characters are you drawing today? What can we... We don't believe in recreational fun activities. Everything has to be productive around here. So... Oh, yeah, it's not, I mean, it's not recreational. I, I gave myself a project to come up with 100 characters that, like, different just characters that came from my brain without trying to be influenced from anything. And so I'm at about 93 right now, and I'm just Whoa. working towards the end. Well, the glasses have to come off for this. Congratulations, you're getting close to the end right. of your goal. That's huge. Yeah, I took about a three-month break, but I'm... Come oh, back to it. It would have felt it would have been so much better if you hadn't said that. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to share my your reputation meter went down. Your yeah. Instagram profile in the um comments so we can see your art. That'd be awesome. Oh yeah, Definitely. please do. Add Smith and Fritzy. Smith Smith and Fritzy? Mm-hmm. Smith and Fritzy. Who's Fritzy? It's my lawyer company and uh, art. Oh cool. Okay. Well, Wayne, uh, please get to work. Stop wasting time and we'll check in with you and 
until then, we will uh, we'll take on some questions. So this is the segment of the show we call The Shitstorm. Hi. Hey, Tracy, let me have it. What do we got? I have a question. I just need clarification. Wait, do you have a question? For you. A personal For question? You, yes. Okay. Do you want the glasses the on or off? Uh, it doesn't matter. I okay. think they should stay on. I'm going to keep them on. Um, are they the highlighted ones or the non-highlighted? Oh, you can pick from from both. Okay. But I got really good ones for the ones that have already. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, question number one. Can we change our attachment style? Yes. No. Oh. <laughs> yes. Can, can sure. we? Yes. We can change our attachment style. You can style. change your attachment style. You're so sarcastic right now. <laughs> okay. Please tell, glasses. please tell us. Um, if you know your attachment style and you know the way in which it is creating chaos in your relationships in your life, you can change it. And one of the reasons that they suggest that you have secure people in your life is because that then shows your nervous system what secure connection feels like. And then once you have that, so if you have that in any kind of area of your life, let's say you have lifelong friends or you always feel really securely attached to people at work, you can use that to then model secure attachment in whatever part of your life. Usually it's romantic relationships. Um, and re, you can change your attachment style. It's malleable. I would agree. I think it's a very painful process, though. Yeah. Um, and part of the pain is bringing it into the light, like realizing what yeah, it cause is. Yeah, because you spend your whole life in one, or most people do, in, in one sort of zone. And the thing is that people don't know that they have a style. That they're, The thing about being in a frame, a psychological frame, is that you don't know that you're in a frame. You don't know that your reality is something that's been manufactured by your psyche to keep you together. Mm -hmm. And the first step is understanding that you have a way of being. And mm -hmm. most people just don't know that. Oh, Amy in the chat asks a great question. I would also guess that trauma would change it. I mean, trauma, it creates the not secure attachment styles, right? Yes. Basically. And, well, so early, early trauma, developmental trauma will shape the, the attachment style into one of the, the, the ones that are tricky. And, um, but also adulthood trauma and, and abusive relationships, for example, can change you from secure to anxious. You also might notice that your um, attachment style changes within a particular relationship dynamic. And it's really important to understand that that's not necessarily you bringing that in. We can't just pathologize that and say, well, that's your attachment style. It could be that the dynamic is bringing out an attachment style itself. Does that make sense? Yeah, I was just mortified. I just wiped my nose and it was in the wide shot. <laughs> Just <laughs> did something happen? Come on. Can so can trauma create a massive like attachment style shift? Yeah, like uh, dropping a bomb on somebody. Totally, it can cause. They used to the first definition of trauma was that it was something that was so intense that it changed your personality, which I love that definition. We don't have to go on a thing about that because mm -hmm. it's it doesn't it doesn't say this kind of event is traumatic and this one isn't. Right. It says anything that's intense enough to change your personality. Especially an adult. Right. Like I feel like, yeah, children totally. are much more malleable and mm -hmm. they shift all the time. Right. But, uh, yeah. I was, I got into a wormhole one time looking at rapid personality shifts in a positive direction. Mm -hmm. Like when people just wake up and feel like they're just a completely different person. They're going to. Does that actually happen? Yeah. And uh, Freud's notes were that rapid personality shifts are the, it's the, it's the same stimulus as a like what what we used to call nervous breakdowns mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's just in an opposite direction huh. mm -hmm. but it generally happens from a painful awful thing mm -hmm. huh. rupture yeah but so, so to change your attachment style because that's i su assume like what the question is underneath the question um the first thing you have to do is figure out what which attachment style you're tending towards and in what kind of relationship and what does that behavior then usually show up as um, and then um, bringing that to your partner, that awareness, and then also some information about what secure attachment would feel like um, where you've had it in the other spaces of your life is a great place to start. Then you have a bunch of data to move around. So what is an anxious attachment style? How do, you, how do I recognize these people? I mean, I would say they're clingy. Mm -hmm. That would be the sort of the, the lay way of looking at it. Clingy. Um, <clears throat> uh constantly they need reassurance they need you know they're you know every time someone walks out of the room they they kind of lose their mind a little bit I, I think one of the ways of thinking about it is like with um uh with 
babies, I think they don't have the idea of object permanence yet. So when the parent leaves the room for a baby, my understanding, and, and correct me if this is off, uh, the par- it's never, the parent has ceased to exist. Mm-hmm. And I think with anxious people with anxious attachment styles, it's almost like if the person isn't there, if they don't have that reassurance in the moment, then it's gone forever. Mm-hmm. And it could be the feel, like, so what changes, that's exactly right. I think what changes is the f- you don't trust that the person still feels the way about you that they did when they were in the room next to you. Exactly. And so every interaction that you have is sort of like a test. Like, do you still love me? Do you still love me? Do you still accept me? Mm-hmm. That's instead exhausting. Of, yeah. Instead of getting to like a, a place of sort of rest where you're like, yeah, I haven't seen Sam in a couple of days, but like I feel solid in our mm-hmm. friendship and know that he's going to be around. It's interesting because I, I find that I'm generally avoidant. And then in certain relationships, I'm really anxious. Okay. How does avoidant show up for you? Um, I don't know. Like, I don't like giving people hugs. <laughs> I don't like, um, <clears throat> I don't know. I, I tend to, when people invite me out for something or want to connect, my default is, oh yeah, no, I don't want to do that. And I never really Doesn't thought Doesn't it feel good to be invited though? Um, that that's the thing you think it would be, but like, I never really realized that that was a frame until maybe about 10 years ago. I'm like, oh, I, that's a thing with me. I do that. I, I tend to push people away, but it just seemed, it just seemed natural to me which is so weird. No, but it does. That's the thing. And this is where like attraction, sorry, we have to go get to other questions, but like our attraction and no one wants to hear this is based on our attachment style because it feels like home. And Mm -hmm. so if you're disorganized, I mean, sorry, if you're avoidant, Mm -hmm. then you had a childhood where you had some amount of distance Mm -hmm. that was established as this is home. This is what the world is supposed to feel like. Mm -hmm. And so then you recreate that in the rest of your life, even if cognitively you don't want that Mm -hmm. because it's home. So Mm -hmm. you're trying to recreate home. Yeah, anything that isn't home is uncomfortable. And you just avoid it the way you would avoid anything that doesn't feel good. So they think parents not giving enough attention to the child creates an anxious attachment. It could be consistency as well. Okay. So it's not necessarily that there's like a certain amount of love that you get, but also like if your parent is really loving in one moment and then kind of terrifying in another moment, that Mm -hmm. then sets you up as well for any of the three. Mm -hmm. And then what about an avoidant? So let's get into avoidant. Well, how's that differ from anxious? anxious? So anxious is a little clingy. Mm -hmm. Avoidant is... Like the opposite. That. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. What creates those people? Um, I mean, it can be abuse. It can be just a lot of nothing in the house. Neglect. Neglect. Yeah. Uh, I remember when I started, um, I was teaching chess when I was uh, maybe in my early 20s, and I would go into people's homes to teach chess, and I would think that the families were acting very strangely. They were smiling, and they were enjoying each other's company, and they were holding hands, and um, and it was, and the kids were happy and they were all talking to each other. It was, a, it was a um, bizarre. Isn't that awful? <laughs> Reminds me of baseball season. Yeah. Nothing hurts me more than baseball season. Why is that? Happy families. <laughs> Gross. <laughs> Sorry. I don't even need to put the glasses I on think for if, that. I if feel you that wanna, way. If you want to know about avoidant, <laughs> avoidant attachment style, just, just go, you know, go to downtown San Francisco, you know, or, or you know, watch, watch a busy intersection with people, you know, head down kind of, that's avoidant. I think there's a, sta- there's a difference though between like standoffishness and avoidant. And mm-hmm. avoidant is going to like know that they want connection, try to seek it, establish it, and then pull back. Someone who's standoffish, that could be something different, right? Okay. Anything? What do we sure. uh, what do we call someone? You know, uh, let's we'll say this is a, a friend of mine uh, who <laughs> is uh, gets very attached to people, mm-hmm. maybe anxious, and then at the like year or two year mark, s- tends to push people away or sabotage. Disorganized. No. Mm-hmm. Well, my friend would not agree with that. <laughs> I have a, I have another question. <laughs> yes. To keep you on track. Sorry. Um, why do I always end up with narcissists? Ah, oh. I got this. Okay, so <laughs> narcissists are the top of the food chain in the humans. They're the best, and everyone else is just prey animals for them. So if, if think about predators. Okay, so you have your narcissists at the top. They're basically the lions. They're the lion king. They're king shit around human society. And they're going to go after members of the herd because when you can victimize people, you should. That's your manifest destiny. Anyway... The reason why you, human, always end up with narcissists is pretty simple. And when I say it, you're going to kick yourself. So when you watch lions go after herd animals, who do they go after? 
do they go after the strong and capable self-actualized animals the leaders of the pack no that's not who they go after they go after the weak little babies in the pack and you are just the easy pickings of humanity that's why you always end up with narcissists um right so that's an incredibly terrible analogy <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but there's there's truth in it in the sense that I think there are certain ter- personality types that do attract narcissists. Uh, one example, and this is a little reductive, but someone who is um, standoffish uh, or avoidant or whatever, um, a narcissist will be able to, they have no, a lot of them have no fear and they're very charming. So they will, they will, when you're avoidant, you can sometimes filter for the people who are the most aggressive because you will, no one else, people will respect your boundaries, but a narcissist will just trample on them. Um, that's one aspect. And I, I do think though, that there is more to it in the sense that there's something about the charm and about the, there's a certain glow that narcissists have. Well, the, the confidence is, a, it's hard to decide what is confidence and what is competence, right? Yeah, so generally very competent people show confidence. Yeah. And so and it also, can be very confusing <clears throat> if you're attracted to narcissists are very good at um, fooling you for quite some time. It can go on for as much long as a year or two um, where they can keep up a whole charade and then Ooh, is like two a, years. Yeah. Is that a Yeah. So how much time do I still have with you people? <laughs> <laughs> Tick tock. Um, I also think when we, when we think about attraction again, no one wants to hear this. We often are attracted to things that we need to heal. And so um, before we freak out about that, that actually means that we get a ton of data and helpful healing information by looking at the, the situations we've been in that are you know bad. So if you're attracting narcissists, I don't believe that, I don't think it's that simple. I don't think we, we're drawing in narcissists. Um, I think if, but if you notice that pattern in your life, it's worth figuring out how and in what way that narcissist feels like home. And that could be in their charm. It could also be in the inconsistency. Um, It could be in the way that you feel sort of like not okay in the relationship. And that's exciting, which makes it feel like the honeymoon stage lasts for a really long time because the whole thing sort of feels precarious. Um, There's a lot in there that can help you heal. But narcissists aren't going to go after skilled people. I think they, I I think it depends on the, the arc. I think that like, some narcissists really do want because that that there should be a, unlike a narcissist animals, defense class. There should. <laughs> They're hard to spot. I mean, they practice on people. You know, they take notes about how to yeah. manipulate people. Um, and, and I, I'm of the opinion that the the narcissist and the sociopath are kind of on a spectrum. Mm-hmm. And a so a sociopath will stand in the mirror and literally practice facial expressions. Mm-hmm. Um, narcissists, you'll hear narcissists, like you, if you're here, like they're, I've, I've talked to a lot of them, like when I worked in treatment and they will mm-hmm. s- talk in very frank terms about how to manipulate people. Yep. And they know, they know how to pick out your It's weakness. very painful to hear you both talk about me this way. All right, Tracy, what's your next question? <laughs> uh, why do all my boyfriends cheat on me? Oh, oh yes. Okay. So <laughs> all your boyfriends cheat on you because you're not the one they want to end up with. You are temporary. You're like an airport. You're fun to get, you're fun to like hang out with while you're getting to where you're going, but it's not where you want to live. So um, that's not true. (laughs) Um, I'm going to say something a a little bit risky, but um, I I do feel like that there are a certain uh, small percentage of men that a lot of, or and women, that a lot of people find very, very attractive. And so those people are so high value that they can dump anyone anytime. And so if you're going for the person who's perceived as, that's an important phrase there, high value, that the, a lot of those folks just like, you're disposable to them a lot of times. So maybe, um, I don't know. Settle? So like. A know. little bit in a way. Or yeah. change your expectations, or change your your what you feel that you're entitled to in a relationship. It is a whole different thing to date somebody incredibly gorgeous. It can be problematic. Yeah, it's hard. And none of your because yeah. like everywhere they go, they're just getting like offerings, like genital offerings, <laughs> all day. <laughs> is that how you feel every day? Yeah, <laughs> That's, it's exhausting. So I feel so yeah. bad for you. I have to grow this beard to like you know be more repellent. Is that why you're single? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> Single by choice. 
No, that's next week. Next week is sad and single. Andrea said, so. who's the high value? The person being cheated on. Unfortunately, I think what Ben is saying, the person who is the cheater yes. is the high value per, Well, perceived as. Perceived Because I think that they're actually low value. Yeah. Oh, interesting. <laughs> they're like morally low. Yeah, value. they are. Well, yeah. they're, they're, I mean, they yeah. have all the, I see this a lot in the city. It's like there's, there's one man who's dating all the women and one woman who's dating all the men. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. They look the same. They act the same. They wander in the same neighborhoods. They have the same dogs. This is in San Francisco? <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> what dogs signify these uh, people? Corgis. Um, <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Labradoodles? La no. Well, <laughs> no. Right? I find that Labradoodles, no, the people that have Labradoodles are actually much much more mellow. But Can um, we do a research study? That's like a All right. What's the thing? next question? <laughs> okay. I am avoidant. Boyfriend is secure. Kind of annoying. He won't let me bolt. Oh secure God. is overrated. If you are the boyfriend, run. <laughs> run. Go find yourself a nice, secure he, person. He won't. Build your beautiful life together with this person. Run away. You have, you're worth more than this. He won't let me bolt. What do you suppose she means by that? Maybe she's She anxious? keeps trying to fuck other people. Is what it, no, she, uh, so she's disorganized and she, or she sorry, she's run. avoidant and so she wants avoidant. to run and he's like, I see your bullshit but and I'm not going to let you. Oh. oh. Like he's Exhausty and mm. All right, next question. Sorry. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> get it out i think that i think that that's really actually important because i see i don't know if you see this with clients i see this with clients all the time who are trying to heal their attachment style stuff and they get into a relationship and it's not as exciting and so they want to blow it up because they want to go back i mean unconsciously they want to go back to the to the disorganized stuff and they have to hold on because sometimes a really healthy relationship feels a little boring yeah that's true and it relationships does, are boring it's <laughs> That's why I'm not in one. Thank you, Sam. Perfect. Womp, womp, Next womp. question. <laughs> um, let's see. Should I not pay attention to the size of the wave, but focus? Oh, no, we're out of good questions. All right, one. now for the next segment of the show. Thank you, Tracy. <laughs> size of the wave? <laughs> yeah, it was a penis thing. Oh. We'll do oh, it. We'll talk Jesus. about my penis Wetness. <laughs> All right, now for the next segment of the show. Phony <laughs> Okay, now that the number's up, we can continue to talk about genitalia, but now at least people can know that they you're can call prepared. in. I'm good. It is time uh, to call in, folks. If you're watching, you are welcome on the show. And Wayne, how's it going over there? It's going great. Tell me things. Do you want to see? Yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah. <gasps> oh, wow. Oh, cool. Who oh, wow. is this character? I, I don't know. It's just coming out of my brain. Oh, shit. Is, that like a, a, is that an aquatic character? Is that like a Day of the Dead type thing? I don't know. What? I just started with the skull and then thought a sexy body on it might be weird. And what inspired <laughs> those? Are those hand boobs? Does it have boobs for? I him? don't know. He's just going it's, with the it's creative flow. It's all unconscious. Flow. It's it's the the whole the whole part of it is just to like let it's like free creation you Th know, this is what comes out when we talk about out without any <laughs> reference you have to be careful we we have a young in here if, if he gets too close of a look at that he'll really start to draw some conclusions <laughs> call, call me later <laughs> <laughs> let's do some analysis it does look like a water creature though i, I love though that it's coming out like as number one i think the artistic kind of thing the flow is fascinating and two i think whoa, whoa. Uh, so what are you disorganized attachment. are you um, that looks kind of like a little are you drawing those onto the screen itself yeah yeah ben, yeah come on man what this do is you color them it's in? an ipad pro yeah I, do. I don't know these things all right um i like it it's a little like rorschachy mm -hmm. you know that character of rorschach Here, this is what it looks like when yeah. they're colored in. Oh, yes. man. That's like really that good. Palette. All right. That that's hurts amazing. me. Thank you. That, Ouch. That's a personal. Do you make those into NFTs? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? You could be like uh, Beeple and make a gajillion dollars. Mm. Mm. All right. We have, mm. uh, we have an audience. Into higher pursuits. We have an audience of cowards. No one is calling. It's so sad. Uh, we, we here we go for that call. one. Ready? Yeah. Okay. Hello. Welcome to Shitty Life Advice. Hi. Thanks. Hi. Who am I speaking to? Um, my name is Shania. Shania. Hi. Welcome to the show. <laughs> it's it's not Shania. Okay. We'll <laughs> call you Shania. That's cool. That's still a cool name. What can we help you with? Um, I don't 
know. I just feel like I need some like general like pep talk about like how to be in relationship with people. And um, I feel question. like maybe everybody else is like doing it wrong and maybe I'm doing it right. But is that how everybody feels? How do your relationships tend to play out? What's that? How do your relationships tend to play out? Um, I would say they start like really exciting and like every friendship I have and every relationship I have, it's like the best thing that's ever happened to me. And then like, you know, something shifts or like, I think maybe I start to feel like I'm not like good enough for the person or something happens. And so, well, you should always I, keep people strung along as long as you possibly can. But you know, generally when things get boring, that's the time to cheat. Right, even in a, like a friendship, though. You can cheat on your friends. I'm sure there's a way to do that. <laughs> I cheat on Sam all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Who? <laughs> I can't tell you that. <laughs> oh, and who's Squirrel Master? Hello, that is a great that username. That is a great username. Dim glasses. Dim glasses. Okay, this is a great question. So there's a lot going on here. Number one, there's some comparison between you and other people. Did you say that you feel like other people are doing relationships right and you're doing it wrong, or the other way around? Kind of the other way around, but like maybe I'm wrong about that. But I feel like the way I am doing things, like just makes sense. I feel like I don't necessarily understand other people and like what their motivations are and what they're doing. And then that is confusing. Have you thought about asking them? Um, no, that sounds really scary and confrontational. <laughs> well, I mean, there's non-confrontational ways to do it. You can, you can say something like, Hey, I was wondering if we could have a conversation about our, our relationship, our friendship. Uh, would you be open to that? Or even just information style. You can say, Hey, what is, what does friendship mean to you? Or what is, what does a healthy relationship look like to you and see what they say. And I would also say when you, your response of, Hey, that sounds scary. Maybe the reason you're having some trouble because you're avoiding having those kinds of conversations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and my heart is just beating very fast even just thinking about having yeah, that yeah. type of conversation. Don't worry, you so. should not have those conversations. Those conversations <laughs> are hard, and that's why you just make new friends. So so what I recommend is start yeah. start small. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, have have a conversation. Like, what? Think of try to think of the least confrontational or the, the, the person you get along with the most and talk about something that's really minimal, perhaps. I'm, I'm struggling for words here, but like... Low stakes. Low st Yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, it's kind of like like exposure therapy, like just uh, which is how they get rid of phobias, you know, like um, right. just a little bite at a time. And I would also think, okay. you know, do some journaling or work with a therapist on intimacy and w in what way. So we, we want to know what it is that's making your heart beat quickly, um, because when you can drill down to that, then you can figure out what to kind of expose yourself to so that you can kind of numb that stressor a little bit so is it that you're afraid that your friends are going to reject you is it you're afraid yeah. you're going to be humiliated yes you are, so that resonates that your friends are going to reject mm -hmm. you okay so that's the core so we just found like the little the the nugget of where all this is coming from and so there's so many things you can do with that piece of information now um, what does rejection mean? Where was the first place that it started? You could create a timeline so that you can see how rejection kind of started to shape the way you relate to the outside world. Um, what else can we do with that? I Wayne, Wayne what, do you, what do you think? What would you do? Who? Wayne. No, Wayne. Wayne. <laughs> my, new, my new friend. Um. I got to be honest, I was kind of like really into my drawing. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Wayne, let's see what you take. Let's see what you've gotten done. Wayne wasn't listening. He would draw some hand boobs about what it. Is, what are you so proud of over there? Let's see the, <laughs> let's see what happens. There's nothing. <laughs> I, I'm just, I'm still working on the same one. It's just, uh, Wayne, are you going to be able to, to, to it. are you going to be able to colorize those by the end of the show? No. We, we, that might hold be on. Difficult, this, but is, I'll try. this is super this important. This is a tangent. We've just yeah. exposed oh, our caller. Oh, thank God we have another caller. Oh. Wait, hold on, hold on. We've just exposed our caller to an example of rejection because Wayne just rejected her. She reached mm. out. Click. Right. <laughs> Hello? Hello. Hello. Welcome to Shitty Life Advice. How may I help you? Hi, Sam. This is Ronnie. Oh, hello, Ronnie. Hi. I wanted to call and ask about stable relationships. Uh, especially at work, because I've been working at the same place for six years. Uh, that entire 
fan has been just kind of uh, like every chapter has been me fighting with a different person. And all of the people that I've been fighting with are gone now. And I'm like, should I just leave? I just get along with everyone at work. It's just <laughs> calm and relaxing. This is very and important. I kind of want to leave. <laughs> now is the time to find a new enemy. You need a scapegoat. You need somebody to pin <laughs> all your problems on. What would happen if your performance starts to fall and you don't have somebody immediately that you want to throw under the bus? Well, luckily there's someone right here that she knows I well. I don't work there. But you could, no. she could work you into the, her fold. I think the thing that's going on here is that is exactly what we were describing a couple minutes ago, where when you feel like you're in this calm environment, all of a sudden it starts to feel a little boring and that can actually like kind of trigger the nervous system into like freak out. I got to blow things up. I have to create chaos. I need a, I need an enemy, whatever. But I think if you can try to feel into the discomfort of the calm a little bit, you can welcome it into your life. Why do you suppose, I agree with that completely, why do you suppose people feel uncomfortable with calm? And like that happens in romantic relationships too. What, what's going on? Because when your nervous system is set up for chaos and franticness, calm feels alarming. Right. Because your nervous system starts to calm down. It's almost like, you know, when you fall, go to fall asleep at night and then you jump. Mm -hmm. like yeah. It's oh, like, wow. Hold on. Glass got to come off. That's yeah. me. Yeah. 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 Do you think is that is that connected to your piece on trauma bonding where people get kind of addicted to the. <laughs> is that I mean, I don't mean to <laughs> yeah. read into what your stuff is, but like no, where sure. they get caught up in the cycle of, of abuse and. Yep. Okay, and then there's actually like a neurological thing where the brain yeah. is like, ooh, I like this up and down thing. Yep. Is yep. that in your book? Yep. What's the book called? The book is called Unbroken. The trauma response is never think, wrong. I don't think Sam has read your book. Available yet. for pre-order. <laughs> he, he was reading it at the beginning of the show. Okay, first of all, Ben, we're going to read it together in a book club. <laughs> second of all, uh, I'm really glad that didn't hurt you, by the way. But second of all, um, no, I haven't read it yet. The, um, but I have the audio version. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things you're exactly right. So the um, we think that we are addicted to the abuse or the negative relationship or whatever. And part of the reason is because that's the, the way the bad research sort of theorized it in the beginning. But now we know that what happens when you have um, intermittent abuse that's mixed with love is that that releases these huge outputs of happy chemicals and you get addicted to the happy chemicals. Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's like so ecstasy. Yeah, it is. Oh God. And so a calm relationship can feel very foreign to your system, which has been adapted to that extreme fluctuation. Squirrel Master wants to know when the book comes out and when the audio comes out. It comes out on March 14th. Audio comes out the same day. Um, you but get you can pre-order it right now. I know. Do you think also that calm, it a long time ago. calm is sort of a signal for like, it, like real intimacy, like, like, like the, like the, the simple caring that goes into a long-term relationship that really works and that people are running from that. Yes. But it's so quiet. They don't even know they're running from yes. it. Yes. Yes. And they will create all manner of chaos to make yeah. it look like they're not running. This person is a narcissist. This person is this. I always experience that. Blah blah blah. Right. And calm is like the end of the 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 honeymoon, yeah. right? When you start to mm -hmm. settle. Yeah. So Which, for for many people, that's when you get cut off. Yep. That's when yeah. you get cut off from your what I drugs. Tell my yeah, totally. what I tell my yeah. patients is that it's sort of like. Um, that in the first three months of relationship, nature or God kind of takes care of you. And then you're like, you're on your own. Mm -hmm. I like to stress test relationships. So I like to front load them really heavy, like basically almost move in together. But oh, see, that's, see. Th that's, yeah. cr cr can I go there? Yeah. <laughs> you can always go there. That you're creating your, you're setting yourself up for that year break. I, that was a friend I was break. talking about. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, you're setting yourself up for failure in one way or another because you're you're front loading the, the part of the relationship that already has tons of happy chemicals with more stressor and then more happy chemicals. You think living together is the happy chemical part? I always thought that getting to no, see each other stressor. twice a week. It's a stressor. So you're you're mixing it, right? So yeah. you're like, we're, we'll see each other twice a week now. Okay, now I want to stress test the relationships. So you have a bunch of happy Five chemicals days. going on. We're going to do five days we're going to see if we hate each other yeah. and you're increasing the amount of stress you're you're introducing into your system which is creating a lot more noise which is contributing to and potentially making the honeymoon stage last longer 
not because it's all just like flat good, but because it's that intermittent thing. That's what we're addicted to is the intermittent piece. So normal dating, like seeing each other twice a week sounds awful. It sounds so bad. What do you prefer? Just six days a week. Just enmeshment. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That sounds awful to me. Yeah, I know, but you're an avoider. Well, and the other well, thing Well, I'm that also we more realistic. Are, are you now? <laughs> I think so. We'll see about that. The sooner. other thing that's you're underneath... My frame beats your frame. Hold, please. The other thing that's <laughs> underneath <laughs> the things that we're talking about is the fact that, like, we never talk about the fact that when we are intimately connected with another person, especially in a romantic relationship, we are at our most vulnerable. It is the scariest fucking thing we do as human beings. And we cloak it in... Hallmark movies and ridiculous shit and no one talks about how scary it is. Of course our nervous systems are trying to like create chaos to get us out of it. Okay. Well, uh, with that being said, I think we're going to move to the final segment of the show, which is our come down. So Wayne, first of all, I just want to say thank you. It was such a pleasure <laughs> to get to hang out with you today. Uh, where do we find your art again? It's at Smith and Fritzy on Instagram or Smith and .com. Okay. Thank you so much. I can't wait to dive into it later today. Oh, Thank you, Wayne. And then for our two experts, is there anything you want to end the show with? Is there anything you think that we didn't get a chance to that's really important that people should walk away with? I have an analogy that I often talk about. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so in uh, astronomy, there's a term called the Goldilocks zone which is when you have two orbiting, when you have a planet that's orbiting a star, its ideal distance from the star for life to form is where water is liquid. So if the star is larger, the water will evaporate at a certain distance and, and so on and so forth. So there's an ideal difference where life can thrive. And with human beings, the same thing is true. So there's an ideal dis distance from uh, between two people where the relationship can thrive. So the relationship doesn't mean the relationship's amazing, but like, you know, if someone is in a way too hot and you get too close to them, the, the relationship dissolves. And so there's a certain there's a certain ideal distance. And so what I've learned through that analogy to be very patient and kind of figure out with each person that I meet, what is the ideal distance from this person where things can work? And then, of course, I look at myself and like maybe I'm feeling too hot. And the person's too close. I'm like, yikes, this is too this is too much. Congratulations, Ben, on dating such a hottie. <laughs> <laughs> what? I was just making fun of your analogy. It's a good analogy. Yeah, okay. I like it. Thank you. Okay. MC, is there anything you want to add? I think I just want you to know you're not as broken as you think you are and try not to put yourself in a singular box and figure out, take some online tests and say, I am disorganized, therefore I'm eternally fucked. It's just not true. Okay. And if people would like to follow up with either of you, where is a good place to do that? I'm at um, mc.phd on Instagram, and I have a website, alchemycoaching.life. And I'm at benjaminrusick.com, and I also have a podcast called Look, Just Tell Me What to Do, available on most platforms. Thank you both for being here. All Thank right, you. that's it for today, folks. My name is Sam. This is a ongoing project, which is a collaboration between friends, and we are trying to just make a slight improvement each week. So if you have ideas about what can make the show better, Please give us a call. Um, can you put the number up on the screen for me? 415-799-50-something. Uh, nope. Technical difficulties. Hello. All right. Uh, if you click the play button on the scene before. 415-799-6653. Oh, there it is. Oh, I was watching the delayed screen. There we go. Okay. Uh, please leave us a voicemail. Also, if you would like to ask a question and have your voice come on to this lovely program, you can leave us a voicemail with any question that you'd like. And we'd love your ideas. We'd love your tips. And most importantly, if you enjoy the show, there's not a lot of viewers now, but we would love if you could share it with your friends and maybe say, hey, this is kind of fun. Let's, let's watch this together. And anything else? Until next time, I will, we will. See you next week, which is Valentine's Day, and our episode will be sad and single. So please let all your pathetic <laughs> and useless friends uh, know that that will be next episode. And if you would like to submit a question, I generally post a call out for questions on my Instagram. That's at Sam Lamont. This show is filmed at Square One Studio. It's a production of Hello Humans. 
And you can find us at hellohumans.co or square the number one dot studio. And until next week, I hope you have a great week.